Claire Southerton and I'm a postdoc in the Vitalities Lab in the Centre for Social Research in Health and the Social Policy Research Centre at UNSW Sydney. I'm excited to bring you this webinar today titled TikTok Methods that's going to provide you an overview of the innovative research methods I used to qualitatively analyse the short form videos on TikTok, which is a social media platform. Because TikTok is a relatively new platform and certainly a relatively new space for social research, I thought it might be helpful to explain how I approached it as an empirical site. So first I'm going to give you an overview of what TikTok is and what it looks like, and then I'm going to outline my research project and explain why I wanted to analyse TikTok. Then I'll go on to give you some theoretical background before explaining my method in detail. And I'll provide some findings and then wrap up with a bit of further reading that will be helpful if you're interested in using a similar method yourself. But before I go into that detail, here's just a brief description of my method. What I did was qualitative analysis of short form videos on TikTok that was oriented towards their collective affects rather than individual videos. So I drew on visual analysis and specifically innovative visual analysis that is oriented towards what an image does rather than what it represents. And specifically I drew on the work of sociologist Vicki Bell. I also incorporated atmospheric methods here using the work of geographers Ben Anderson and James Ash. I also drew on some work on GIFs and Vines um, from Highfield and Lever some really excellent work that examines the specific methodological challenges of working with these short form videos and especially videos that are repeated when they're viewed. Um, that was really helpful for me, especially because there's a lot of similarities between GIFs, Vines and TikTok videos as I'll go on to explain. So what is TikTok? Well, TikTok is a short form video creating and sharing app and the app is really known for its viral content that uses lip syncing and dancing. The videos are quite short, they're usually around 15 seconds long. And the platform is very popular with about 800 million active users. And popularity has really increased significantly over the COVID-19 pandemic period, with TikTok hitting a record-breaking 2 billion global downloads in April of this year. The app is currently outperforming major social media competitors like Facebook, Instagram, um, Snapchat and other platforms that we would think of as being kind of real major players in this space. Um, in terms of the interface, I've got some GIFs here that give you a bit of a sense of what TikTok actually looks like. And you can see that it's, it's organized largely by hashtag. And if you click on the hashtag, you can see a selection of videos that use that hashtag. What you can see from these um, GIFs here is that it's a highly visual platform and it's also a really dynamic space with things that change often. So there's a lot of trending topics on TikTok, um, a lot of kind of um, challenges, like a, a dance challenge or um, uh, to replicate a particular meme. So it's a really changing space. Um, and another thing to note about TikTok is the videos kind of cohere into these trends. So there's something collective going on here beyond the kind of individual videos. And that's something that I'll come back to later when I talk about um, the methods. So for my research project, I was interested in the way that health information, specifically information about COVID, was circulating on TikTok. This was especially timely given that TikTok was becoming more and more popular during the pandemic. But health content on the app has been a growing trend even prior to the pandemic. So even before COVID-19 spread, doctors and nurses have been sharing medical information as well as participating in viral trends that have been, had been um, popular on TikTok. So you would, might have seen um, videos of doctors and nurses participating in dancing formation type videos that had been popular even, um, even well before the COVID-19 pandemic. As of the 8th of June 2020, the hashtag Doctors of TikTok has 116.6 million views and hashtag Nurses of TikTok has 239.8 million views. So they're really significant trends on the site with popular accounts of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals attracting millions of followers. At the same time, there was an emerging discourse around COVID-19 about the infodemic, which is a term coined by the World Health Organization to describe the kind of overabundance of information 
which they say makes it difficult to distinguish truth from misinformation um, surrounding the pandemic. And social media has really, in particular, been implicated in this infodemic as a source of misinformation. And many platforms, including TikTok, have been criticised for their role in the spread of COVID-19 fake news. And in response, the platforms, including TikTok, have responded by attempting to prioritise content from official sources like the World Health Organization um, and other organi organisations like Red Cross. So they've, they've been trying to um, reorganise the way content is, is, is placed on their sites so that official sources of information appear um, at the top of searches, for example. However, they've really been unsuccessful in challenging the demand for inform informal sources of information. Informal sources of information about COVID-19, like TikTok videos, are very much framed in these discussions as inherently suspect because they are kind of multiple fragmented, emotional, kind of the, the constant kind of competing narratives um, of different TikToks that tell different stories is kind of really seen as a problem here. In these discussions, there's often been a limiting dichotomy of misinformation on the one hand and factual information on the other. I really wanted to move beyond this framing to consider what is what this kind of circulating, shifting, multiplying space of health information on TikTok creates and makes possible. So just to provide a bit more background on the theory that informs this approach. In this project, I draw on the concept of effective atmospheres. An effective atmosphere refers to the ways our capacities are modulated by our environment. This environment is constituted by humans, non-humans, interfaces and habits in ways that are collective rather than individual. An affect here refers not to emotion in a personal sense, but rather to feeling that is more collective. So broadly, this is a method that is informed by new materialist thinking, and it's interested in what something does rather than determining what it is, rather than kind of categorizing it. My approach to the TikToks was primarily motivated by wanting a method that could account for their collective elements rather than wanting to analyze them in an isolated way. So I wanted to do something that would be a bit different than a conventional content analysis. So in order to kind of notice shifts in the effect of atmospheres, I drew on um, the atmospheric methods Ben Anderson and James Ash explain as requiring a kind of qualitative vocabulary of thresholds and tipping points. So in response to this idea, I sought to collect data that allowed me to kind of become attentive to these thresholds. I also drew on Highfield and Lever's work on GIFs and Vine clips in which they emphasise the kind of specific methodological challenges that these media forms present. But also they, they emphasise that they are expressive rather than representational. So their work really um, emphasised to me the importance of noticing the kind of specific temporality um, of these forms. Um, they argue that these forms of media, these short um, GIFs being very short clips, Vines also being short, short videos, very comparable to, to TikToks, um, they argue that they're rendered meaningful or humorous because they're watched repeatedly or because they are short. And that's um, really important to think about in the context of TikToks as well. So what did I actually do? Um, I collected a sample of 200 TikToks selected by searching hashtags on the app. I used hashtags, um, the hashtag coronavirus, hashtag COVID-19, hashtag doctors of TikTok and hashtag nurses of TikTok. In this case, traditional, traditional sampling methods like random sampling, for example, weren't really appropriate here as I wanted to collect a sample that was indicative of what a user may encounter. Um, TikTok search engine optimization algorithm, um, so that's the way that the search engine um, is tailored to a particular user's needs, so it may present them with different um, videos than it may present a different user. Um, this algorithm is, is proprietary, so it's not possible for us to know exactly how results are generated. Um, it's also not possible then to get entirely depersonalized search results. Um, however, I did create a new TikTok account 
um, for the data I collected, just to minimise as much as possible the personalization. Um, though, again, because I was attempting to collect a sample that might be indicative of what a user may encounter, it wasn't so important to avoid all personalization for this approach. The, process, the collection process involved viewing the TikToks multiple times and recording um, what I had watched, the key elements and reflections, what emerged through re-watching and the kind of resonances between the TikToks. So not just um, what was in a singular TikTok, but kind of what emerged as I went through the process of watching them. So things that kind of come out between um, different TikToks. Importantly, the data collection process was not focused necessarily on um, an individual video or individual videos, um, though I did, of course, record the details of each TikTok I watched, but rather the kind of collective affects um, of each hashtag so um, I was also especially interested in how they different hashtags may cultivate kind of different collective affects. The data obtained using this method took two forms. So I had the kind of um, record of all the TikToks that I collected, um, organized by hashtag with um, information about the, with the URL, um, other related hashtags and um, basic information about the videos that I had watched um, but I also kept a research diary alongside to document the viewing process and to help myself um, recall um, what that that process was like. As I mentioned in analyzing the TikToks I employed a method that involved watching the, the video on repeat a number of times as they would likely be viewed this way by users so on the app um, videos automatically replay until a user shifts to the next video. Um, I sought to become attuned to the shifting affects throughout the video as the video looped, with the emergent elements of the video being notable upon re-watching. Um, and this is a really important aspect of the video of the method because um, as I drew from Highfield and Lever's work, the specific capacities of the platform um, afford the re-watching um, and encourage the re-watching of videos and therefore there are particular elements of this kind of media that are more perceptible um, on re-watching. These forms of media require the researcher to kind of sit with the loop, um, as I kind of describe it, in order to encounter the communicative capacities of this um, digital object. This is kind of how it normally operates. Um, it's also important to talk a little bit, a little bit about ethics here um, when analysing social media content. Um, the ethics of using social media content for research purposes have been a topic of significant discussion within the academic community. And TikTok, though it's certainly a platform where the orientation of much of the content posted here is kind of seeking virality and to some extent, um, and to seeking a large audience certainly, um, and to some extent that does imply a kind of public visibility but this doesn't automatically resolve any privacy concerns. And a lot of scholars in the internet studies community have really emphasized this. In my analysis, I elected not to reference specific TikTok usernames. And when I offer a rich description of a specific video, um, which I do um, when I write up the data for publication, I ensure that I choose quite carefully what video I offer that description of and ensure that it doesn't have fewer than 100,000 views with the thinking that that video would not reasonably be considered private. In addition, by focusing my analysis on the top 50 videos under these very popular hashtags, it's unlikely that um, these videos would be videos with a low number of views. So that also somewhat mitigates that risk, but it's something that should always be evaluated in context. And now to some findings um, regarding the method. When I was watching the videos, I was really surprised by um, how my re-watching really attuned me to very different elements of the videos. Um, it was really important for this method that the videos were watched um, over and over in a single setting. 
um, and really I wasn't I wasn't particularly prescriptive about um, how many times I needed to rewatch um, each TikTok. So I didn't say, you know, I have to rewatch them each ten times, because um, some TikToks didn't require as much rewatching as others, but some really required me to kind of sit in the loop um, for a quite a long time because they were very rich in small details that, that only emerged kind of on re-watching. Um, but I was really struck by how many um, emergent things came out um, in that process. This method really allowed me to notice the way that um, TikTok is really um, a, a kind of um, referential platform, the way that um, TikToks engage in complex kind of conversation with each other. Um, and this occurs through mimic, mir mimicry trends. Um, so there are a lot of trends on TikTok that involve, um, there's a form of TikTok called a duet where you take someone else's video and make a video that plays alongside it. Um, so that's a very direct form of um, um, referring to another video, but there are also many other trends. So a viral dance trend where you'll try and undertake a dance um, that a lot of other people are trying to do. Um, but you, there's a lot of things on TikTok that render it a kind of um, space where collective participation is really important. Um, but this method really allowed me to become attuned to that by looking at the way that videos speak to each other and relate to each other and cultivate something beyond each individual video. Um, I think that future iterations of this method could really consider engaging participants in this process. Um, so of course this is me analyzing the TikToks, but getting participants to engage in viewing the TikToks and completing the diary, I think that would be an interesting way to take this method further um, and to see uh, what people's experiences were. And I've just got some further reading for you here. So these were the key, the key sources that I drew on in developing my methodology. And um, hopefully these will be helpful to you if you're interested in using this kind of approach, if you're interested in um, analyzing, particularly if you're interested in analyzing short form videos. And if you are interested in looking at TikTok, do feel free to get in touch with me. Um, on social media or via email. Thanks for listening.